Welcome to Lilongwe Wildlife Center, Malawi's only wildlife sanctuary. It is a protected wilderness in the heart of the city. The sanctuary is also known as People and Wildlife Center, the first of its kind in the world, working with the local communities through education and outreach projects with the aim of conserving Malawi's wildlife and environments. Unlike a zoo, where animals are kept in small cages, In the past, Lingadzi River used to be a home for a lot of wild animals, ranging from fish to birds. However, this is not the case today. Due to deforestation, the river does not hold as much water as it used to. Hence, fish species are almost extinct and only a few birds inhabit the area. In addition, most of the trees along the river have dried up. The Lilongwe Wildlife Center is taking some measures to conserve natural resources for instance, by ensuring that no human beings cut down trees along the river. These are hinged back to toys and they were all rescued by members of the public who found them in their gardens or on the road. Some have had cracks in their shells from being attacked by dogs or hit by cars, so we had to glue them back together. Tortoises generally have a lifespan similar to that of humans, although some species of tortoises, like the giant tortoise, have known to be over 150 years old. They vary greatly in size, depending on species. In fact, the oldest one ever recorded was over 200 years old. Their shells help to protect them against predators. We also had a great eagle owl, which was recently successfully released, adjacent to Kasungu National Park. When he was rescued, he had a badly broken wing, which we plastered up. We also helped him to learn to fly again and build up his strength. He was released in Kasungu National Park, where there is a lot of forest habitat, which this species prefers. Certain species of owls regurgitate and cough out a mass of undigested food called pallets, that may contain the whole skeleton and feathers of their prey. We have over 40 yellow baboons in total, many of whom have been rescued again having been kept as pets or being sold illegally. Many were orphaned when their parents were killed. They tend to live in groups of between 30 and 80, although sometimes they can be up to 300 in a troop. As with the vervet troops, they are made up of a mixture of sexes and ages, and they have a strict hierarchy. Buddy is the head of this troop and he is much bigger than the others. You can see here. 
Then there are other juvenile males like Deza and Lucky, who are always fighting for their place in the rankings and for the attention of the females. Buddy is especially aggressive and he needs to maintain his position. His teeth are this big. These baboons will eventually be released into the wild and it is important that we prepare them properly. We have just integrated two smaller troops into a bigger troop which is more likely to survive against predators and other troops of baboons in the area. We also have to prepare them to forage for food in the wild. So for example, we might bring in fruits from the sausage trees or collect insects for them. Or we will hide food in the trees. We also check that they are aware of what a predator is through exposure training. For example, we use plastic snakes and cutouts of birds of prey and it is important that they react appropriately to this if they are going to be considered for release. Our release site at the moment is at Kasungu National Park in an area where there are few humans and enough food and water for them. rescue a lot of baboons. Our ideal is actually to, that we are able to release those animals again back into the wild. Today we start with the, moving the group of buddy, 30 yellow baboons, in, the, in a, a new enclosure. It's an, a special enclosure where we're going to prepare this group for their release later this year. The group is about 30 animals in total and uh, today we aim to do the first 10, the big males and the adult females with their young. Um, we're going to knock them down, we do a medical check, they get all their identification, so they get colored earrings, uh, so we can recognize them when they go into the new enclosure. And uh, after they, they wake up, then yeah, they go outside, because the first time in a very new and brand new and very big enclosure. So going to be really exciting. I am Richard Sona, a veterinarian at the Wildlife Center. The individuals that we started with today are the big you know, dangerous males or big alpha females, you know, that um, we essentially cannot physically restrain with maybe a net or any other device that is not chemical. We try to reduce the, um, um, the possibility of or potential of an accident by darting. <coughs> I should take about five, six minutes for him to take effect. And probably within the next eight minutes, we should be moving in. Uh, the first one was Buddy. Buddy is the alpha male because there is always a um, group hierarchy dynamics that you need to consider when you're moving animals and. Um, so it was seen prudent to start with him, so that um, you know the the uh, protocol that we're using, you know, goes smoothly. Otherwise, um, it cannot be random getting a big guy or getting a small one. It needs to be all, you know, done systematically. We 
basically have to check for check the health status, check for TB, you know, check for parasites, you know, look at um, any kind of disabilities that they might have. And the reason for this is obviously to try and release uh, healthy animals into the wild so that we can keep the wild populations, you know, um, healthy and not introduce human diseases to them. Erosion of the upper middle incisors. Erosion upper middle. Yeah. TB test done? Yeah. Normally with the, 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 the drug that we use, it should take about 45 minutes, you know, for him to come around. He took us a while to, you know, to work on and um, there wasn't any apparent need to reverse him because um, he's a big guy and he was the first one to work on. The reverse was quite um, expensive as well. So we essentially had to let him go through the um, anesthesia and um, again it might also be of benefit to, to the other ones that you know, might might turn victim to him if he, they find him fully awake. So that's also a bit strategic in a way. Well, my role is here as the release manager, so I need to take care of every training that will be carried out here. So that is my principal role to see. And uh, after this training, six months, what we'll do is we'll identify those animals that are well adapted to the new training such that they can be released in the wild and they will expect them to survive in the wild. So we take one from the side. So I'm just measuring the body length. carry the animal up to their new enclosure where you can find the animal. This is the first animal in the new enclosure. They will spend six months here and uh, for the six months that they will be here, we have two main aspects that we need to carry out. We have rehabilitation and under rehabilitation we have uh, three aspects. We have feeding. Under this feeding we want to see how the animals, we want to train the animals, rehabilitate them to see how they can feed on food that is found in the wild because now in the wild, the animals will not provide them with food. So they need to look for food on their own. So that's why we want to keep them in this enclosure where you have natural food and then we encourage them to feed on natural food. The next aspect is group cohesion. Now these animals need to be in a group. They should be that strength. They need to maintain some sort of strength in the wild because once there is the group cohesion, it becomes possible for these animals not to be attacked by predators. Hello. We have two babies. There will be somebody who will come and observe all the animals, how they will ascend from their sleeping sites which animal gets down first and which animal comes down first, last. And we notice that uh, what we are expecting is that the, the group leader always leads. He has to ascend first and then the, animal, the other animals will follow. Likewise, when he's descending, he descends first, then the other animals will follow. So then we have the second greatest part is a training. And this training, we need to train the animals on the, how to identify predators. So we'll do a snake training we we'll do a dog training and then human avoidance. So this is principally, in a, in a nutshell, what we'll be doing in this new enclosure. I'm very happy, I'm very happy with that. Yeah. This, was, this, this was actually a quite 
big project to move 30 baboons here doing a medical check. Uh, release them in a completely new enclosure. We've been working for three months on this enclosure really hard and it's always exciting when you see animals like this now going out. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful enclosure with lots of natural uh, vegetation, big trees in there and it's so wonderful to see those, those, those big animals there now outside. It's, uh, yeah. it's a bit emotional. Yeah. Free. He's going to meet the wife. <laughs> oh, oh, it's very, very well, very smoothly. Um, you went as um, you know, I've had beyond our no. expectation, it's really. Usually. Everything has been done, all samples have been collected. We need to try and um, prepare them adequately, appropriately for release. You know, they don't, they don't really belong here, they belong in the wild, they need to be free. So this is uh, an opportunity that many other animals like this may never get, so these are the lucky ones. At this moment we have one big sponsor, which is the Born Free Foundation. It's uh, one of the biggest sponsors of this project. At this moment we are still collecting money from it, uh, trying to get other funders to come in. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's if you want to do a good release project and you want to do it the proper way, like we would like to do, to, to also give it a big chance of success in the world later on, then you we really need people to help us and sponsor this project. And then hopefully from there. Um, this is the vet clinic over here and the volunteer house behind me. Um, so this is where we treat all the animals and all the animals that first come in are in quarantine in this building. And then we have um, the animal enclosures all around us. We have, um, we have multiple cages that we can keep animals in um, until they get well. So, um, and, or when they're in quarantine. So some animals have to stay in quarantine for about six to, to 12 weeks. Okay. So it depends on the animal, depends if they're sick when they come in. Yeah. Um, and so we keep them in these cages so they can't have access to each other. Okay. They, uh, they, they just stay in the one cage for okay. the whole time. Okay. And we do several tests on them while they're here. So that they, um, so that we know that they're healthy, so that they don't have any diseases okay. that we can catch or that the other monkeys can catch. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and then in this last cage, it's still a quarantine cage, but there's a bird in this one, so an owl. Um, so a little bit different to the monkeys. What was the Um I think that he felt he's only young, oh. and he probably fell out of the tree um, in a wind so and he can't fly yeah so he may have a, a broken bone in his just like a collarbone yeah. uh, so he's been here about a week and he'll be here for another four weeks until this heals <clears throat> and then we'll be able to teach him to fly and release him then you release him that's right yeah so the aim is to release the animals back into the wild if we can oh, right. um, so all these all these animals get put into the monkeys get put into groups yeah so that then eventually we can release them into the oh, right. different parks all oh, right yeah so you keep the animals long as it is it's healed or you can just abandon it maybe that's stay for so long without heal, getting healed what do you do there um, so those animals will will stay here 
for, for, for their lifetime. Oh, right. um, if we yeah, if we can't fix them yeah. um, and their quality of life is okay, but but they're not able to go back to the wild, then they'll stay here. Right. If they're too sick and we can't do anything about it and they're in a lot of pain, yeah. then we would possibly not continue their care. Oh. Um, yeah, use okay. them. But, but yeah, most of them um, are fine and they will, you know, if they can't be released, they'll stay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes. this is the um, this is the actual clinic. <laughs> We've just done an anaesthetic actually on this monkey. So Andy is watching him right. wake up. All right, all right. So he's, he's, he's a bit sleepy again. Okay. Well, I'm just watching this little one as he's come round from the anaesthetic, mm -hmm. and um, I'm spending. Uh, three weeks over here from the UK as a volunteer, just helping around the area and learning a bit about the animals. Um, and it's, it's great fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this animal was um, received last night from um, Salima. From Salima? Yeah, so he had been, um, he'd been kept probably by somebody. Um, What's the problem with him? Well, he, he's quite thin um, okay. and he was dehydrated. So he's, he's not really sick, but he's just been kept by a member of the public as a pet, yeah, yeah. which is illegal, which is not allowed. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they, they eventually, most people get sick of them because they're difficult to look after. Yeah, they don't know how to treat them. And they don't know how to look after them, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they start to bite and they, you know, okay. they poo and wee everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they eventually get sick of them and, and they handed it to um, the park. Kuti Park near um, near Salima, yeah, yeah, and so it. then they they brought it here. Okay. Yeah. So we've just done some tests and um, and had a really good look at him today, and he'll just go into quarantine for the next six weeks. All right. Yeah. Okay. So this is where we do all our um, our treatments. Okay. Um, we have an anaesthetic machine, and you know we do all our anaesthesia in this room. We um, Anything that's really sick or needs surgery, we do here. Okay. So it's kind of a busy place. All right. Yeah. So the, the treatment, I mean, the, the, the treatment that can be given to a human being is just the same you give it to the, the to the monkey. Yeah, that's All right. right. Yeah. The same drugs. Very similar. Yes. All right. Yeah. Most I can see you have antibiotics somewhere. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Antibiotics and um, pain relief. So. Yeah. Some yeah. drips, you know. Yeah. Right. Fluids. That's yeah, right. This would be fun to use. Yeah. And then you've been here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And you also. Thank you. Okay. All right, we'll see you on Monday. Right, we'll see, you on Monday. You. see you later. It's about 40, 160, roughly. Yeah. What did you get? Could you feel the pulse? Yeah. No, it doesn't it's pretty good. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Four people in. I'm very This is Gambuku, which also means leopard in Chichewa. He was born in 1996 and came to us from the old Lilongwe Zoo when he was nine years old. Prior to that, he was in Nika National Park. He was caught in Proche's snare, which caused his knee to break and it never properly healed. The Department of National Parks and Wildlife were hoping to take him back to Nika but his injury proved to be too bad. His knee was shattered. For this reason, he can never go back to the wild because he has lost his ability to hunt efficiently and his natural instincts have been deteriorated over time. Leopards are solitary and shy and nocturnal animals. And the spots actually are very good camouflage. They play a trick on the mind because the spots break up the overall shape and the mind finds it hard to distinguish the outline. They catch their prey by silent stalking. 
get very close to the prey, then pounce on it. Unfortunately, the leopard is endangered in Malawi due to habitat loss, especially because of the decline of forests, and there are very few left. The biggest threat to the African leopard population is humans. They are hunted for their fur and sport and often killed for eating. It is important that we do our best to conserve these beautiful animals as they are an important part of the natural heritage of Malawi and it is a symbol of power. It is also important that you help Malawi conserve its beautiful creatures. Porcupines are rodents. Their bodies are covered with sharp spines and quills. Some porcupines have thousands of quills on their body. Porcupines can't shoot out their quills, but they will be easily released when they are threatened by predators. Lost quills are replaced with new quills. Porcupines are nocturnal animals. This means they sleep during the day and become active in the night. They use their strong feet and curved claws to climb trees. They are excellent climbers. They are herbivores. They like to eat leaves and fruits. Their babies are called porcupids. Young porcupines leave their parents after a few months. Porcupines can live for 15 to 20 years. Henry the python came to us from Lilongwe Zoo when it was shut down. He is an African rock python and was born in 2001. So he is now 10 years old. This species is Africa's largest snake and can grow up to 10 meters in length. Henry is around 4 meters. Pythons are not venomous. They kill their prey by constriction and swallow it whole generally while it is still alive. They can go for up to a year without eating if they have had a very large meal. Young pythons eat primarily small rodents, which makes them popular with local farmers for reducing the population of species harmful to crops, like the cane rat. However, Adults are capable of taking very large prey, including young crocodiles, goats and gazelles. Attacks on humans are very uncommon. However, you should remember that snakes are very useful for keeping away other rodents like rats. They are also very territorial and if you kill one snake, it is likely that another will come in to take its place. The best way to avoid a snake bite is always to keep away from long grass or if you do walk through it, make sure you are wearing closed shoes and long trousers. If you see one, back away slowly. But actually, most snakes are harmless, so you shouldn't worry too much. One more interesting fact to finish with. Snake scales are made up of something called carotene which is the same thing that our fingernails are made from. Bella came to us from Romania in Europe in 2009 at the age of six after she was rescued from a zoo by a charity, the Born Free Foundation. As far as we know, Bella spent all her life in captivity. She once had a mate and even had two cubs, but they died and she was left all alone. You will probably know that Romania is a very cold country and she spent many months of the year in the snow, which is no place for an African lion. Imagine how cold she was. She was also very poorly treated and didn't receive the proper food so her bones didn't develop properly. 
and that is why she walks with a swagger. Because of the malnutrition, she also ended up with glycoma, which affected her eyes and she had to have one of them removed. She can never be released into the wild because of her injuries, and she will live out her days in this huge enclosure. We are hoping to find a mate for her one day, as lions prefer to live in family groups called prides, which are made up of one or two male lions, five to six female lions, and male and female cubs. Lions generally have a preference for feeding on wildebeests, impalas, buffalo, zebras, and warthogs. Of course, getting this kind of meat is impossible for Bella, but she is rather fussy and will only eat the best steak. In the pride, the female lions do the hunting and we make sure Bella has to work a little bit for her food. So we might hang her meat on a rope or hide it in a box for her to sniff out. Sometimes when she is active, she will stalk the volunteers along the side of the enclosure. And we are not sure if she is just playing or thinking about her dinner. And did you know that even though the female does the hunting, the male lion always gets to eat first? It is quite possible that lions will become extinct in Malawi. Many carnivores like lions are endangered. Humans not only hunt them, but because of a growing human population, there is pressure on the habitat they live in and also less prey for them to hunt too. This is an example of why centuries like ours are so important, to provide century to wild animals like this and also show people why conservation of wild animals and the environment we share is important. Here are our crocodiles, Sheila and Bushdog. Bushdog was born in 1995. He came to us from the old Lilongwe Zoo and was the last resident to be rescued. Before he was at the crocodile farm in Kodagoda, Sheila was rescued from Mao Mission and we are not sure how old she is. Neither can be released back into the wild as they have been in captivity for too long. Crocodiles can be found across the world in Asia, America, Australia, as well as Africa. And these are African Nile crocodiles. You can see that they look a little bit like dinosaurs. And fossils of crocodiles have been found to date back as far as 55 million years ago. The Nile crocodile is the largest African crocodile species and can grow up to six meters in length. In the wild, they live for an average of 45 years, but in captivity, they can live to over 100 years. They are found in wide range of freshwater habitats. Fish and small vertebrates make about 70% of their diet. However, they are opportunistic hunters and can potentially eat anything that comes to the water's edge, including prey as large as wildebeest. Here at the century, we have eight antelopes, one bushbuck, six common diker, three are females, and one grace buck. All three antelope species are native to Malawi. These animals have been rescued from captivity and will be released into the national park or into the wilderness zone here at the center. Mr. Kola was released into the wilderness zone, but he came back to the enclosure. The male daika are mostly fighting over the females. The common diker is a small antelope with small horns found everywhere in Africa, south of the Sahara. Their names come from the Afrikaans meaning 
of Dika, which is diving, since when they are threatened, they duck and dive for cover under vegetation. The bushbuck is a medium-sized antelope, easily recognized by vertical white stripes and dots on its sides. They have a bushy tail, which they hold upright when fleeing. Bushbucks are generally solitary, but pairs and small groups are commonly seen. Males exhibit age hierarchy, but bushbucks are not territorial. Grace buck is a small, stout, reddish-brown antelope. They are very secretive and not often seen. They are restricted to northern, eastern, southern Africa and are not endangered. However, little is known about their ecology. They are almost entirely nocturnal but can be seen in early mornings and late afternoons.